So, uh, I'm Ritesh and Uma is the co-presenter. And unfortunately, Uma couldn't make it for the talk, uh, so I'm here all by myself. Uh, so, before, a few minutes back, I was asking folks about where they are in their understanding of HDFS internals or ozone, and it looks like the audience is fairly new to both, or at least in terms of the in-depth discussion for storage. So, I will start off with a brief set of features, what ozone offers, why it's relevant, why the architecture is done the way it is done, and what is the end result from a competitive landscape standpoint. And uh, feel free, this is, uh, I've done similar talks in the past, and I think it's useful to take the talk wherever the audience goes, because like afterwards, if somebody has, they can always show up in a forum and ask questions, but right now you all are right here. So wherever you all want to take the discussion, feel free to interrupt at any point in time, ask questions at any point in time. This is a very informal talk. And I would rather have you all ask questions and me answer them than me just try to go through the slide deck. So that's generally going to be the approach. So what are we going to do today? My plan before we change directions, if we have to, is to introduce. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, like with any product development, there are a lot of tensions about in features, implementations, and complexity, right? And you have to come up with a trade-off as to what is it that you have to implement and why do customers or users care about it. Uh, that drives the architecture, and then you go out and people compare you with other storage offerings. And the most important is how you all can help if you all have free cycles, because at the end of it, uh, Ozone is a community project. It's an Apache project, top level project. And uh, Ozone, in some sense, is the way forward to not having all our data being held hostage by cloud companies. So if you want to bring data on-prem, you don't want to lose control over your data to cloud providers, then for the future, in, within the Apache community, Ozone is your best bet, because HDFS is dated and doesn't have a bunch of features going forward, and there is the open source landscape is kind of fragmented. There's no really compelling offering that can be a successor for HDFS, and Ozone's mission and plan has to be, is from the very get-go, and it has to reach that, is to be the successor for HDFS for everything big data, and a lot more. So we'll cover both the and a lot more part as well as why Ozone matters. So as I mentioned, uh, Ozone is a top-level Apache project right there with HDFS. Um, from the get-go, Ozone was designed to be an object store that works as per the needs of the big data ecosystem. Right? So Ozone fits in where HDFS fits in very well. Um, so in addition to HDFS file system interface, the reality is S3 is one of the dominant standards for reading and writing files. There are many pros and cons of do using S3, and Ozone implements both. Uh, you have a question? Okay. <laughs> so if you uh, rub your head, I'm going to think that you have a question. So, <laughs> so Ozone is designed to scale. Uh, what does that mean? Scale is a very uh, arbitrary term, right? Uh, so where HDFS stops is where Ozone can start and continue, right? Ozone can start from where HDFS starts, but where HDFS stops, Ozone can still continue further, right? Many folds over, and we'll kind of see those numbers uh, later on. Um, we had a talk, I think Ricardo was talking about table formats and the move to data lakes, um, uh, and one of the things he brought up is that there is a need to separate compute and storage. Right? Because the scaling requirements of compute and storage work differently. And if you look at the costing of getting a storage cluster on-prem, it is significantly cheaper to have a few very dense storage nodes. So high density has been a feature that has been uh, one of the top line items for Ozone. Um, it's also been born in the ecosystem of big data, so it works with the entire, like a whole bunch of existing open source uh, big data tools. Um, it also works for object store workloads, so you can use it for content storage and distribution without running any analytics on it. You could use it for CDNs. Right. Uh, from the get-go, it is strongly consistent. Uh, this now is not, almost all object stores now are strongly consistent to some extent. Ozone is, so has been strongly consistent from the get-go when it was started. Uh, it also has some of the harder APIs, such as rename um, and other atomic file system operations that other object stores cannot implement. So what are the features, right? 
uh, very first is APIs. Ozone supports Hadoop. Ozone supports S3, right? And you can have the same data be available on both interfaces. And this is a huge feature. Ozone can scale. If you are used to HDFS, I've heard of companies having block police. Their job is to go around and find out what is the block size various applications are writing to and police them. Because HDFS cannot handle certain workloads. With Ozone, you can say goodbye to all those problems. You can store small files, billions of them, or you can say billions of large files. Ozone, and we'll come to the architecture and why that matters, Ozone doesn't care about the object size. You can have billions of any size objects that you want. And these can be objects like S3 objects, or these can be directories and files like Hadoop. Uh, Ozone, at least uh, one of the partners is e in the ecosystem, one of the partner hardware vendors, has close to 500 terabyte hardware nodes that are certified to run on Ozone. So you can almost have half a petabyte behind a single node. There is no theoretical limit. That's just what was available in terms of certification from a hardware vendor standpoint. So you could go higher. There obviously are trade-offs. You need to have fat pipes coming into that node. You don't want to suck from a, throw, uh, from a straw from a big pool, right? So you want to have a fat pipe. So you need to have networking that goes with high density, and Ozone supports all of that. In terms of that was scaling up, right? How much you can scale a single node. The second aspect is how wide can you go? How many nodes can you have? Because of the architectural differences over HDFS, Ozone can go to thousands of nodes without much fanfare, right? In fact, in our test clusters in-house, we scale our clusters to thousands of uh, like fake nodes, or we go to billions of objects, and it's not. It's, it's, it's a no event. It, it happens. It, it, there is, in HDFS, to get to a billion objects or to get to 1,000 nodes, you need to write a blog after you achieve it, right? I don't think anybody will be writing blogs about they got 2,000 nodes on Ozone because it'll, be an, it'll just happen, right? It won't be a big deal. My computer is very eager to sleep. It's jet lagged. <laughs> um, one of the things about um, Ozone is most companies, when they have on-prem data centers. It's not as elastic as a cloud. You can't just add a petabyte of cluster overnight. Right? That's just the reality of running a data center. You need to find floor space. The hardware needs to come. So the granularity at which you can expand your cluster is very important. Right? You should be able to just add a node. You should be just able to add a rack. Right? You should be able to add drives to a node. Right? These are some of the requirements that Ozone was born with. If you go out and see some other vendors in object stores, they will require you to double your capacity whenever you plan to expand. Right? How many companies have doubled the floor space available <laughs> whenever you all want? Right? So as your application grows and your needs grow, Ozone is designed to be able to expand. And with expansion, the next obvious step is rebalancing. Right? Uh, there are hashing-based systems that have storage stored in hash-based schemes in distributed systems. For them, rebalancing is moving all the data around because they just have to readjust the entire hash scheme. Right? With Ozone, the way it is designed, you can only do incremental rebalancing such that it's a minimal amount of data you need to move around in the cluster such that there's even load in the entire cluster. So these are features, these are not the, these are not the sexy features that storage systems ever talk about, but if you have run a HDFS cluster in production, you really care about these features. Right? And they're not great demos because you just show you wrote a file and it moved to some other node, but these are things that are very hard to implement, test, and get it right in production that storage systems have to do. And that's the reason why storage systems take a long time to mature. Um, at the scale that Ozone operates, managing the workload and managing the operational runtime is very hard. So we have built, we have the capability of tracking all the metrics that Ozone generates and dashboarding it. Like dashboarding is a major effort within a community to try to create dashboards for the various workloads for the various performance aspects of the system in, uh, at scale. And these are things that have been done from day zero within Ozone. Uh, how are we doing on any questions so far? OK, moving forward. So if you, if you all know about HDFS, HDFS is you have very similar to your file system on your laptop. You have directories and files. Now, HDFS is not POSIX compliant. It's its own protocol. But Ozone supports um, file system hierarchy the way HDFS implements it. Right? 
So in your namespace, you have something called volume at the very beginning. So when you create your namespace, you're know, trying to create your um, data set, right? You need to plan out volumes. Volumes can be your development data set, staging data set, production data set, right? They can have the same bucket names. Now buckets are very similar to S3 buckets, right? So you have volume, which could be tenant. So you can map volumes to multiple concepts. Within those, you have buckets. When you create buckets, you have to make a choice. Is this bucket going to be efficient for Hadoop use cases? Or is it going to be more efficient for S3 key value kind of store where you don't really have directories, you have prefixes, right? They are just string values, right? So you have to make this plan out because there are certain compatibility issues between the two. S3 doesn't work efficiently for all Hadoop use cases and Hadoop doesn't work efficiently for S3 use cases. You can share the data and expose it during using both protocols, the same data set, but in terms of what that bucket is designed to do, there is a little bit of upfront planning that you have to do. Initially, Ozone community did go with just one bucket type and try to make it work for, work for both use cases, but there were too many corner cases where things broke, and we had to kind of say, okay, we need to have bucket types, S3 and Hadoop file system, and you can use a Hadoop file system in S3, but the other way around doesn't work because you cannot atomically rename a prefix in S3. Right? This is just not possible the way S3 is implemented. So continuing on, now one of the things is like best of many worlds. What is the other best of many worlds that Ozone offers? Is that you don't have to decide that is my entire big data ecosystem going to be all erasure coded? Right? There are certain vendors out there who have uh, object stores where it's only erasure coding. You cannot have anything else. Right? With Ozone, you can actually select on a per file basis whether that file is going to be replicated or whether it's going to be erasure coded, right? Now, most users will not do on a per file basis. They will create a bucket and they'll set the bucket type. So this is an erasure coded bucket and this is a replicated bucket. So why does it matter? It matters because your workload might want to read random offsets in your file, right? If it's going to read random offsets in your file, having to read an entire uh, erasure coded column is going to be expensive, right? Uh, on the other hand, you might have a use case where you want to have the most storage efficient, um, uh, like from terms of dollars, right? So in uh, erasure coded, you can have the same durability or better, and you can um, essentially pay a fraction of the storage cost than what replicated systems do. So there's a trade-off over here. There are some, some ways where EC actually, erasure coded actually beats out replication in performance too, but it really depends on the hardware that you're bringing to the table. So as a, as a data uh, as a, like data center admin, as a storage admin, you need to kind of make these choices. And we don't force your hand. We, let you gi we give you the options that work for you in terms of what is the best storage model that you have to implement in your data center. So one of the things that Ozone does, and it's been a lot of work, uh, is it has pretty much turnkey security out of the box. If you have 1,000 node clusters which, where you need to have mutual TLS, then your certificate management story is a very important story. Uh, Pifta, had, uh, one of our developers, had given a talk in the last Apache Con around the entire implementation of certificate management. And that's an entire talk, a one-hour talk in itself. Right? Uh, in essence, once you use Ozone for your secure cluster, you don't have to manage certificates on a per node basis, track expirations and stuff. It's all done automatically for you, which is a huge feature. If you're a storage administrator, if you're a data center administrator, these things get done for you on its own. Uh, we integrate into existing Kerberos-based implementations. We just have Kerberos uh, because most of big Hadoop, big, uh, big data ecosystem on-prem is Kerberos-based. Uh, even the S3 security model is integrated with Kerberos with Ozone. Uh, we use Ranger. We, that's one of the most dom uh, popular choices for access control for your data. And uh, this has been a feature that we worked on from the get-go. Uh, Ranger is a very important uh, project within the open source ecosystem. Uh, data encryption, we can allow you to have per data bucket-based keys such that your data on disk is encrypted. And you can have encryption on the wire too. And most of all, 
We are a top-level Apache Software Foundation project. That means all the security things that Apache requires of all its projects apply to us. CVE declaration, having patches out in time. When Log4j hit, we took care of it, right? So these things matter as we talk today morning is uh, with the regulations coming up as to what guarantees do you need to have from our open source project. We are aligned to those things. So another feature we implemented is Snapshot. And Snapshot basically allows you to, uh, to on a per bucket or per volume based snapshot, so you can take a quick point in time copy of the entire data set. And one of the things is that you could delete out of order, so you can have policies where you keep weekly backups where, uh, or monthly backups after six months or yearly backups after a year. Right? So you can have snapshots of your data set, uh, which is transparently done uh, for you. You don't see a performance set of taking snapshots. And you uh, get essentially a pretty, like, it's a, it's a pretty robust feature that is very powerful and allows you to implement a lot of other features, such as site level replications or point in time copies that you can back up. So that's also part of Ozone from last year, I would say, it was when it was mainlined and it was released. So I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. Any questions? Any questions over? <laughs> okay, going once, going twice. Performance. Um, big data comes with performance. Like, there's no point in having slow big data. So, uh, Ozone has two. Uh, the way I think about uh, performance is there are two vectors. If you're reading data, can you saturate the pipe, right, or the disk, right? Either your disk should be utilized to maybe 70, 80 percent, 90 percent, which is 90 is too high, but you should you need a reasonable amount of utilization on your disks, and your network is it, is it close to saturation? And on the metadata side, how many IOPS per second can you do? Right? Like, is it 1,000, 20,000, 30,000 IOPS per second for reads and writes? So we, the community has been uh, focused on trying to optimize these numbers. And we had a talk last ApacheCon where we drove a lot deeper into, we have a follow-up talk coming up in both the China as well as the uh, US uh, ApacheCon where we go a lot deeper into the tools that we used, what are the projects that we implemented to get the better performance? This is kind of like an overview slide. But in the last two years, we have made huge improvements in performance to the, to the extent that I, I feel fairly confident that saying, if your hardware is reasonable, we can saturate the network on reads. And we have reasonable IOPS that you will not face IOPS-based challenges for a significant amount of time. Right? And of course, with performance, it's always improving. We can do better. The hard, new levels, like new performance hardware comes up and you need to adjust accordingly. So performance is obviously you can't you, with big data you can't say performance is optional because at that scale every millisecond that you can shave off an API makes a difference. So that was kind of like a quick whirlwind summary of the various moving parts of Ozone, the various features, and now to dive a little bit into the architectural aspects of it. So for folks who know a little, little bit of uh, HDFS, in HDFS. To simplify it down, leaving Zookeeper and everything out, you have a client library, which is a fat client library. It has a lot of intelligence in it. That goes to the name node. The name node tells which file you want to access, and then it tells you where to go and read it from. And all the data nodes report to name node saying, what do they have? And name node kind of does this join in memory of all the blocks and all the files. So the customer visible files and the data uh, node visible blocks are kind of joined at the name node. Guess what? Name node is now the hottest thing in the cluster because it needs to manage the back end and it needs to scale for the front end. It needs to handle all the APIs that the client library are generating and it needs to handle all the faults, all the recovery, all the rebalancing that happens on the back end. Right? And therefore, name node has always been the problem of performance, of operational complexity, of scale. So the initial, uh, so the, con the, the initial origin of uh, Ozone was within the HDFS community. So many of the contributors for HDFS were the ones that started with Ozone. So they tackled this problem at the very, very beginning itself. So from the very start, Ozone was split into three levels. So you have the big fat client on there that's very similar to HDFS. The Ozone client is also fairly intelligent and has a lot of know-how about how to do a single hop read from a data node. So you don't have to always go through a proxy for protocol changes when you're doing Hadoop uh, file system. 
that talks to ozone manager now ozone manager unlike hdfs is using ratis uh, which was the previous talk in this room for its ha requirements so it's a quorum based uh, replicated set of services that are running in the cluster which means that you have uh, immediate failover you have quick restarts i should have changed the sleep time on my laptop okay um, okay so the ozone the ozone manager is uh, replicated using raft right which is basically which is what gives it the ha properties now within that the namespace that the customer creates be it object or file is managed by ozone manager and all that ozone manager knows is it has these blocks so these files have these blocks and these blocks are stored in these containers and that's about all that ozone manager knows it does not know where the current files are on disk or if there is a fault what is the recovery that needs to get done so this container is managed something by storage container manager and storage container manager is responsible for where is that uh, container located on the data nodes so in some sense the storage container manager just cares about containers where they are so if a drive fails or if a rack fails scm cares about where these containers should be placed for repair ozone manager does not know that there has been a repair right it has a cached version of the container that gets refreshed periodically so it it really doesn't care if there is like a petabyte worth of recovery going on in the back end it only cares about handling the customer originating load so scm tackles all the back end and ozone manager tackles all the front end now obviously there are challenges because ozone manager and scm need to be consistent with each other and we kind of there are other talks that we have given in the past where we go into how that happens but in essence there's division of concerns right ozone manager cares about the front end scale so you can have lots of small files lots of big files ozone manager doesn't care it just cares about how many files and those files get a uh, destaged to disk so everything doesn't need to fit in memory so therefore you can have as many objects as you want there is no limit of billion or 10 billion you can go as high as you like now there are limits that you have tested for because of feasibility and uh, engineering resource time but we so far don't have see we haven't seen much problems in terms of scaling ozone manager in terms of object count and the storage container manager just cares about how many containers and how many data nodes right and so in that sense ozone can scale much better than hdfs uh, and that's primarily because of the architectural choices now the thing i already talked about is that ozone manager there's no background load on it right you could have a entire half of data center blow up and ozone manager wouldn't care right and, and on the other hand you could have a customer show up with writing 1 kilobyte billion files and scm doesn't care about it right so in that sense there's there is a separation of concerns and the only thing in between that cares about both is data node because data node has to serve all the objects and data node also has to serve all the background traffic right for recovery the good thing is data node scale out right scm there's one leader om there is one leader but data nodes you can have thousands so if you land up in a situation where your data nodes are in the hot seat for the workload that you're doing you can make different choices about what kind of hardware you purchase and how you scale it out and you can get you can address the performance concerns okay. now a little bit of comparison uh, chart over here how am i doing on time okay so uh, HDFS the largest clusters out there are in the thousands and i think that's the only storage system like which is out in open source that can do thousands of nodes uh, but the density is only about 100 terabytes with ozones you can go higher in terms of the number of thousands than HDFS but the, but the density is almost order of magnitude more six times more in this is in terms of certified hardware right so that's a huge differentiation from a cost perspective when somebody's planning a data center uh scalability wise customers generally are are scared of going over 500 million because of uh heap limits because of the workload impacts with with ozone you can go into billions very easily without much fanfare uh we have uh, ratus which is an excellent open source project for doing raft and because of which we have fast recovery what does that mean you power off the cluster you power it back on it takes a few minutes and the cluster is back on right the hdfs this can be a huge problem bringing the cluster back online with ozone it's not so much 
the high availability model again due to uh, Rattus is uh, high uh, is active active right all the followers of SCM and OM can immediately take over after election to be the new leader after a fault right with HDFS it's a little bit more involved uh, we have both S3 and Hadoop file system APIs and Hadoop is just Hadoop right HDFS is just HDFS now I'm not going to name the names but this is a <laughs> this is a comparison out there um, there are other object stores out there the ones that we looked at, we tried to see how do we fare in comparison to these other object stores. We had similar things, like one of the things is cluster expansion, right? You can add a node, you can add a rack, you can add drives with ozone. With this other uh, project, you need to double because they use hashing, right? If you use hashing and use static hashing, you have to double your cluster every time, right? You cannot just add a node, right? Or if you add a node, you have to rebalance everything, right? Uh, we have built-in certificate management. At scale, this is huge. Right from a, uh, like, if a storage administrator forgets to re re regenerate his cluster certificates on time, the pain that he's going to face in trying to get the entire cluster back up is unsurmountable. It's it's pretty intense if you have thousands of nodes, right? And it's not that it hasn't happened out there. People have forgotten to certify, like renew the certificates of public websites that are popular. So inside your own data center, somebody forgets to renew a certificate. It happens. Right? Now you can pay some other vendor to get a uh, managed solution to manage the certificates, or you could use Ozone, which has it built in. Um, we have HDFS compliance. Like, there are only so many projects out there that have HDFS compliant stores. We are one of them. This other project does not. Uh, that's just S3. We do S3 and um, S3 API. There is something we're working on to do more POSIX based things. I think it's too early to talk about it. I should have deleted it from the slide, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there, there, there is enough ecosystem out there on top of S3 that you could do efficient POSIX file system using S3 APIs. So we were looking into seeing if we could do something like that. Uh, it's not necessarily something development within Ozone, but just a community project that we could do. Um, again, day two operations, rebalancing, safe decommissioning. What does safe decommissioning mean? If you, if you click decommission on a node, Ozone will make sure that all the objects on that node are, are replicated somewhere else before, you, uh, uh, allow, before it allows you to shut down that data node. That means that you don't have any exposure to data loss just because you have to decommission a node. Right? Uh, it might sound like a simple statement, but the amount of work that goes in to make sure that this happens correctly every time is, is, is a significant amount of work that needs to be put in. Uh, erasure coding, we don't have a cluster-wide configuration for erasure coding. Right? If you spin up a cluster, say a like, 10 petabyte cluster, you only get one choice of erasure coding. You cannot change it. That's not the case. You can choose. This bucket is going to be replicated. This bucket is going to have nine-way stripe. This bucket is going to have five-way stripe. So you have the choice based on your workload and your hardware as to what kind of replication that you want. Uh, we are an Apache license. We are at Apache Con, so that's always a plus for a project. There's a lot of freedom that comes versus AGPL. AGPL has something good and bad, but that's a, that's, as a user, that's something to know about. And uh, we are built on proven algorithms that have TLA proofs that are well vetted by the community rather than coming up with our own DIY implementation that nobody else has vetted. Right. Um, this is another object store out there. Um, they, uh, I haven't seen any record of them scaling to thousands of nodes based on whatever searches I could do. Uh, they have their implementation. They have their legacy because of which they can scale as far as they can scale. Uh, their rebalancing is expensive because, again, hash-based rebalancing, uh, it's, it's implemented in Linux kernel versus in Java. That's a huge differentiation right there because uh, Java is easier to maintain than maintaining Linux kernel versions at the scale. Uh, what else? Uh, they do have POSIX and block, but uh, we just have Hadoop and S3. So. so as this is the part that whenever we come to ApacheCon that we're really interested about, right? Uh, because none of you all, some of you all might be customers, but most of you all are developers, right? And for a project like Ozone, it's really trying to get you all to get an interest in the project, right? Now, obviously, getting into uh, depths of a project takes time, right? Now, there's an excellent opportunity. Uh, we are working, if you go right now and search Apache Ozone and you visit the site that we have, it's not great. <laughs> um, it, it's dated. Uh, it's, it, it shows its legacy. Uh, we are aware of it, and we are trying to improve our site. There is a major initiative going on to come up with a new site, and we have made it really simple for you all to add content. And what we really hope 
is you all go out and try Ozone and say, this sucks and we need to improve the documentation and then you go and help us out, right? Uh, even if one of you does this, it's a huge return of investment of coming out here and talking about Ozone. So I would highly recommend you all. So if you, that's the Jira number, but if you go to the Apache repository in GitHub and search for Ozone, you will see a Ozone dash site come up. Uh, that is the repository for all the website-based content. And there we, you can post a pull request, you can clone it, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, I hope some of you take up on, uh, on that. There is an Asia sync also, I don't know which time zone works for you, but there's a US sync that happens. Uh, we do have GitHub discussions, which is far better than Slack for just engaging with the community because you don't have to create an account. If you have a GitHub account, you can just use discussions to communicate with us. So, uh, and if you are a user of HDFS and you're looking for alternatives, then try us out on a cluster that you might have. Hopefully it's a large enough cluster so we get some good testing done from you all. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a community project. It's like, it takes, a, it takes a whole family to raise a project, right? It's not just one set of people that does it. So uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, contributions coming in from China. In fact, our uh, China community sinks are really active. Uh, there is a thousand node cluster that somebody reported from China. Uh, so it's, it's uh, and there are a bunch of folks in Europe also who use it. And then we have the North America partners. So there, so there are different ways to engage with the community. Slack is obviously there, but GitHub discussion is excellent. And if you all want to try out the hint, hint, the new website is an easy way to get contributions in. So, and also try and get, uh, get up to speed. So 